What's up, Facebook and YouTube? Do you like this new angle? I got a new tripod. Well, it's an old tripod, but I'm trying it out. Let me know what you think of this tripod in the comments. Let's start it up. What is up, folks? This, this audio coming at your ear holes right now is the Emulsion Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Connor. We are on episode 29, and if you're new here, well, this is a show where I talk all about restaurant industry news more often than not on the fine dining end of the spectrum that I'm personally paying attention to on my own journey as a chef myself. The best part about this show is that you can get involved too. I stream the recordings of this show live on Facebook where you can comment and join in on the conversation. And also, I love getting the stories that you think I should be covering if you suggest them to me over on my Twitter, at Justin underscore Kana. And just so I don't forget you, hashtag the emulsion so that I can find whatever questions or stories you want to suggest. Today's beverage, it was insanely hot in my apartment when I woke up this morning in Seattle. It's all hazy outside. It's supposed to be really hot today, and I want to keep all my audio issues to a minimum. I uh, normally close all of my doors and windows in my tiny apartment. Fun fact, Seattle uh, residents, 70% of Seattle residents don't have AC, so I'm part of the majority. And in my attempt to kind of stay hydrated, we've uh, just got some lemon water here that I add a little bit of um, salt to, which is a, a, a fun fact. It's not, it's a pinch of salt. And to all you cooks out there, it's not like our kind of pinch. It's like your mom's pinch, like 10 tiny grains of salt. That's it. Just enough to kind of give that electrolyte boost uh, with the lemon, and the salt also makes sure that your uh, your body holds on to that water that you just drank. Uh, try it next time you're on the hotline. I promise you'll feel better. All right. So the first story today is all about, arguably, the hottest restaurant in the U.S. right now, and that is uh, Dave Barron's Dialogue in L.A., so Rob Report did an actually uh, very thoughtful interview on the entire opening. So I'll spare you all the, the statistics and, of course, the Zac Efron pics that Dave Barron posted today. Because those are all definitely out there, but that's not why you come to this show. The first thing that the Rob Report article cites uh, is, I think, funny and actually something that we covered here on the show during the hype up to this project and that's that there's an ice cream shop one floor underneath the restaurant because the space is inside of a mall. And just to quickly kind of insert my opinion on this, I'm all for it, right? Uh, Lisvaka in Norway, the restaurant I worked at there, was in a museum. And if you can manage to help a space utilize their space more efficiently, and that will cut down on your rent so that you can either you know, buy better ingredients or pay your people more, I'm all for that. So uh, no qualms with the fact that he's right above an ice cream shop. Plus, places like that normally have a little bit of foot traffic happening, right? So if uh, people are coming into, say, like the museum, for example, or the mall anyways, and they can walk by your space, that's just a little extra cherry on top. So I see it as nothing but an upside. So let's get into the interview itself. So when asked about leaving Alinea, Baron gave some really interesting insight. Quote, what they do is so formulated and well executed that it almost feels like they're going to be a guaranteed success. They know what they're doing and they're really, really good at it. I had ideas about how do I grow this? How do I evoke this into the next thing? Or how do I evolve this into the next thing? I apologize. It's just like when you ask someone, why did you leave that show to go to your own show? Well, I couldn't take it in the direction that I wanted to, end quote. And I'm kind of cut that off at an improper point because he does say after, at the end of it that it, it, it's not like they put pressure on him or any sort of whatever. He just wanted to do his own thing, which I completely empathize with. He also mentioned some interesting flavors that are a part of the food um, because the interviewer asks him about what, what's going to be on the menu, of course. Uh, and he says, no doubt that there, that, um, well, at least in my opinion, there's no doubt that the flavors that are executed on this menu come from his experience and research that he went through at Next in Chicago where he says the flavors will bounce between French, Japanese, and Thai. And for those of you that don't know, some of the first menus at Next when Baron ran the show over there were, um, uh, let's see, Paris 1906, the Kaiseki menu that they did, and then also Thailand. So uh, no, no, no doubt that the, the formulaic uh, approach that he went to, what he, that he went through in researching those menus for Next are going to find their way into the menu at Dialogue, and those are obviously flavors that he's very, very passionate about. 
So that's flavor-wise. Format-wise, it follows a traditional kaiseki, aka a, a moment through a period of time. So the early courses should remind you of the previous season, middle courses are towards the current season, and then the end is a nod towards the future. So speaking of seasons, he also made a comment uh, that I'd like a little bit more clarity on. Uh, I'd be interested to hear if any of you have actually been or are going to dialogue because I'd be interested to see. He says, quote, what if we played with the, this idea of everyone saying there's no seasons in LA and you can get things year round? What if we create seasons in LA? What if we write a menu where early courses remind you of the spring, middle of the menu focuses on summer, and then the end looks like towards autumn, end quote. So does that, uh, this is where I'm confused. Like, does that mean that in the middle of the winter they're going to play with this idea? Like, try to make it summer when it's winter time, Or is that the menu that they're doing now? I'd probably assume that they're doing the latter, but um, I've been wrong before. <laughs> Another really interesting point that he made when he was asked about why do a tasting menu right now when most restaurants are moving away from it, Barron says, quote, for me, the whole point of the tasting menu initially was the control. It's controlling the entire experience and it's storytelling. I think diners now, when they're going out, are wanting to just like sit and grab a snack or really immerse themselves in the entertainment aspect of it and imme immerse themselves in an experience. I hope they do because that's what we're doing, end quote. 100% dude this is a great quote there, there there is a great quote that goes something along the lines of if you ever find yourself on the side of the majority it's time to pause and reflect and this is nothing but that right because there's absolutely a flip side of this that I'm going to cover in a story later in the show but things ebb and flow right like we would have all rolled our eyes at a white tablecloth restaurant with a $93 lobster dish three years ago but last week I literally covered a story about it because it's one of the hottest restaurants in New York City right now don't call things dead, just call them out of fashion, right? Food is more similar to fashion than people think. So Baron is seeing, okay, no one's doing a tasting menu, perfect white space. I'll take everyone who wants that kind of experience with minimal competition from anyone and I'll do my own thing. And to me, that's just smart. There's also some great um, bits that the article continues on about pacing and getting inspiration from live music and artists and designers, which I really enjoyed. And as per usual, the full article is linked up in the show notes. I'm not going to quote the entire thing for you. Um, they, they milked a Vespertine review out of him as well, which if you've been listening to the show is a, is a, is a book we closed a few, a few episodes ago for good reason. It's literally become a trend to go and write a review on that place. But I just thought it was funny that they asked him about another restaurant in an interview all about his, his own restaurant is a little bit uh, unwarranted. But finally, they ask him about his ambitions with the project to which he responded, quote, I don't want any diners to come in and walk away and say, that was good. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes after this. I want them to be swept away with what happened in this space. We're taking this as a very serious restaurant. We're doing this as though it could be here. This could, it could be here or this destination up in the mountains that it has a two hour drive to get to. We're not taking any shortcuts at all anywhere. We just spent $15,000 on plates. We want people to come and speak about us at the same level of other restaurants I've worked at or any of the restaurants that I look up to, end quote. If I get to LA, it's on the top of my list. Zero doubt in my mind about it. Next up is a star-studded announcement and an incredible opportunity uh, if you're a cook in the US and you wanna save yourself a trip across the world, and that is the restaurant at Meadowood just announced its chefs for its 12 Days of Christmas dinner series. That happens basically for the middle two weeks of December, and the list is nothing short of awesome. So Mark Nielsen, uh, Manish Merota, the guys from Contra, Sean Brock, uh, Yoshi Takazawa, Thomas Keller, they, they freaking got Thomas Keller, which is crazy because when I was at the French Laundry, they did nothing but talk shit about Meadowood. So that was surprising to me, but many, many more. Um, capping, as usual, with Chris Costow, the chef of Meadowood, doing a dinner on the 23rd of December, which is the final day of, of the entire dinner series, which is also my birthday. Uh -huh. You can go ahead and check out the link I've left. Uh, that'll go straight to my friend Bonjwing's site, ulteriorepicure.com, where you can kind of see the full lineup, a little bit of a description of the story of what happens at this dinner series, as well as all of the past year's dinners. Uh, they did take last year off, so there is 2016 missing from that roster, uh, but that means that this year is going to be that much more awesome. It is definitely some of the best collaboration and also some of the most exciting wine pairings as well that happen during the year, 
at least here in the U.S. So, I, I mean, I would argue the world. They bring chefs from Japan and Europe and uh, India this year. Uh, it's all over the place. So go ahead and also take a little bit of a, a, a throwback to the 2014 list and just watch your mouth kind of like gape open because that was a super, super fun throwback for me. There's, that, that, that list was insane. I will no doubt be covering some of the creativity that happens during uh, those dinners as it gets closer here on the show for sure, especially some of the dishes that are kind of like showstoppers. But I wanted to give you folks a heads up about it because tickets go insanely fast for this uh, this entire gamut of, of, of guest chefs. So as of recording this, I was still able to find tickets online, um, $275 per person. So definitely check that out if you are interested. It's $500 per person for the kitchen counter where you can kind of be in the kitchen the entire time and watch these amazing chefs do their thing, which is crazy. But a portion of it, it also goes to charity, so that makes sense. Flying chefs are out from all over the world also ain't cheap, so I understand that price point. Next up, disclaimer alert. Also, this might turn into a rant, but I'm, I'm secretly okay with that because it's all in good spirit. Alex Stupak of Emplon in New York City dropped a new dessert, and it's a reaction. So, quote, people don't eat dessert all that much anymore, and when they do, they want dot, 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 fruit plates, end quote. So what's the ex-pastry chef to do, right? He built this entire career being insanely talented at, at creating beautiful and delicious desserts at a very, very high level. And then he goes and, and opens Emplon, which is this taco place. And he doesn't want to compromise or lower his standards. So him and his pastry chef, Justin Binney, came up with this seasonally changing platter of fruit. And it's supposed to mimic a crushed ice shellfish platter, if you can kind of get this picture in your head, where it's like a platter with crushed ice and they would normally put like shrimp and oysters and a bunch of other uh, different shellfish related things on this bed of ice picture that but with fruit and tiny little um, almost miniature yeast sized and uh, constructed bites it's to it's, it's, it's variations on a specific fruit so it, this is going to change So that's like stupid cheap. And for me, this is just a classic lesson in listening to your guest, right? There's a unique place between white space, this is what we were talking about with the Dave Barron story, and what everyone wants, which is, you know, insert restaurant trend. And where those two immense forces push together, that's to me where the diamonds are made, right? And that's exactly what Stupak did with this one. I get excited about something like this, so I can only imagine um, hopefully there's a certain amount of demand for the dish in his restaurant. So huge hats off to those guys because when you life, but for me, it, it was definitely a turnoff, right? I love the push and I love the ambition and the extraordinary aura that goes along with these restaurants, but being a cook, they, being a cook there just, it didn't make me happy. I would never change what I did because the experience that I went through definitely put me in the 1% of cooks and it puts me in a place now to cover stories like I do on the show as well as kind of, you know, cherry pick the amazing, I, I, I can now cherry pick the amazing systems and practices. A little bit of his philosophy. Um, but I got a ton of value through learning how they use a medical freezer to flash freeze their fish and then thaw it out to kind of achieve maximum flavor and texture. They'll, um, the freezing uh, makes it, the fish lose a little bit of water, which intensifies the flavor because it's not so watered down. Um, and it's a way to do that without cooking. And if you can manage to do it really fast, you also don't lose any texture. And if anything, you maybe improve the texture a little bit. So there's also a, a, a super dope cutting montage where you can see some uh, some next level knife skills so definitely check that out if you nerd out with that stuff just like I do so a photo of uh, me and my other cook Hubert that's our channel uh, last up and this is I, I truthfully spent way too much time thinking of a non-industry story and I, I, I came up dry I come up with nothing so uh, Nothing that would at least be super valuable for you folks. I've, of course, been consuming a few things over the past few weeks, but I want to make sure that this is something where I share something that I think could bring either joy or 
uh, knowledge to your life in some sort of way. So I didn't find anything. So I'm going to do a first in the history of the emulsion uh, maneuver right now. I want to hear from you guys. So we're all in, we're all different, right? We all have a ton of different interests in addition to cooking. on iTunes if you listen there. Regardless of where you are, I appreciate your ears. So thank you. My name's Justin Kana. Have a good one.